Good day to you all and welcome to this 30th day of September, day 275 in our journey through the Bible. Hello to everyone out there. My name is Hunter. I am your brother, your Bible reading coach, someone who is showing up with you every day to spend some time together in the pages of the Bible. That's right, folks. We are going to do what we do every day. We're going to spend some time now in God's Word. We're going to let His Word spend its time on us. And oh, how we need that, no doubt about that. If you're new to this podcast, just want to let you know that we try and keep it real simple here. We simply read through the Scriptures, and over the course of a year, we will read through the entire Bible, the Old Testament once, the New Testament twice, But more than that, our desire is to have an encounter with the God who is love. So today, we look into the book of Zechariah, chapters 10 through 12, then on to Psalm 126, and we'll finish in Luke's Gospel, chapter 14. This is the word of the Lord. Zechariah 10. Ask the Lord for rain in spring, for he makes the storm clouds, and he will send showers of rain, so every field becomes a lush pasture. Household gods give worthless advice, fortune tellers predict only lies, and interpreters of dreams pronounce falsehoods that give no comfort. So my people are wandering like lost sheep. They are attacked because they have no shepherd. My anger burns against your shepherds, and I will punish these leaders. For the Lord of heaven's armies has arrived to look after Judah, his flock. He will make them strong and glorious like a proud war horse in battle. From Judah will come the cornerstone, the tent peg, the bow for battle, and all the rulers. They will be like mighty warriors in battle, trampling their enemies in the mud under their feet. Since the Lord is with them as they fight, they will overthrow even the enemy's horsemen. I will strengthen Judah and save Israel. I will restore them because of my compassion. It will be as though I had never rejected them, for I am the Lord their God, who will hear their cries. The people of Israel will become like mighty warriors, and their hearts will be made happy as if by wine. Their children too will see it and be glad. Their hearts will rejoice in the Lord. When I whistle to them, they will come running, for I have redeemed them from the few who are left. They will grow as numerous as they were before. Though I have scattered them like seed among the nations, they will still remember me in distant lands. They and their children will survive and return again to Israel. I will bring them back from Egypt and gather them from Assyria. I will resettle them in Gilead and Lebanon until there is no more room for them all. They will pass safely through the sea of distress, for the waves of the sea will be held back, and the waters of the Nile will dry up, the pride of Assyria will be crushed, and the rule of Egypt will end. By my power I will make my people strong, and by my authority they will go wherever they wish. I, the Lord, have spoken. Zechariah 11 Open your doors, Lebanon, so that fire may devour your cedar forests. Weep, you cypress trees, for all the ruined cedars. The majestic ones have fallen Weep, you oaks of Bashan, for the thick forests have been cut down. Listen to the wailing of the shepherds, for their rich pastures are destroyed. Hear the young lions roaring, for their thickets in the Jordan Valley are ruined. This is what the Lord my God says. Go and care for the flock that is intended for slaughter. The buyers slaughter their sheep without remorse. The seller says, Praise the Lord, now I'm rich. Even the shepherds have no compassion for them. Likewise, I will no longer have pity on the people of the land, says the Lord. I will let them fall into each other's hands and into the hands of their king. They will turn the land into a wilderness, and I will not rescue them. So I cared for the flock intended for slaughter, the flock that was oppressed. Then I took two shepherd's staffs and named one favor and the other union. I got rid of their three evil shepherds in a single month, but I became impatient with these sheep, and they hated me too. So I told them, I won't be your shepherd any longer. If you die, you die. If you're killed, you are killed. And let those who remain devour each other. Then I took my staff called Favor 
and cut it in two, showing that I had revoked the covenant I had made with all the nations. That was the end of my covenant with them. The suffering flock was watching me, and they knew that the Lord was speaking through my actions. And I said to them, If you like me, give me my wages, whatever I'm worth, but only if you want to. So they counted out my wages, thirty pieces of silver. And the Lord said to me, Throw it to the potter, this magnificent sum at which they valued me. So I took the thirty coins and threw them to the potter in the temple of the Lord. Then I took my other staff, Union, and cut it in two, showing that the bond of unity between Judah and Israel was broken. Then the Lord said to me, Go again and play the part of a worthless shepherd. This illustrates how I will give this nation a shepherd who will not care for those who are dying, nor look after the young, nor heal the injured, nor feed the healthy. Instead, this shepherd will eat the meat of the fattest sheep and tear off their hooves. What sorrow awaits this worthless shepherd who abandons the flock? The sword will cut his arm and pierce his right eye. His arm will become useless and his right eye completely blind. Zechariah 12 This message concerning the fate of Israel came from the Lord. This message is from the Lord who stretches out the heavens, laid the foundations of the earth, and formed the human spirit. I will make Jerusalem like an intoxicating drink that makes the nearby nations stagger when they send their armies to besiege Jerusalem and Judah. On that day, I will make Jerusalem an immovable rock. All the nations will gather against it to try to move it, but they'll only hurt themselves. On that day, says the Lord, I will cause every horse to panic and every rider to lose his nerve. I will watch over the people of Judah, but I will blind all the horses of their enemies. And the clans of Judah will say to themselves, The people of Jerusalem have found strength in the Lord of Heaven's armies, their God. On that day, I will make the clans of Judah like a flame that sets a woodpile ablaze, or like a burning torch among the sheaves of grain. They will burn up all the neighboring nations, right and left, while the people living in Jerusalem remain secure. The Lord will give victory to the rest of Judah first, before Jerusalem, so that the people of Jerusalem and the royal line of David will not have greater honor than the rest of Judah. On that day, the Lord will defend the people of Jerusalem. The weakest among them will be as mighty as King David, and the royal descendants will be like God, like the angel of the Lord who goes before them. For on that day, I will begin to destroy all the nations that come against Jerusalem. Then I will pour out a spirit of grace and prayer on the family of David and on the people of Jerusalem. They will look on me, whom they have pierced, and mourn for him as for an only son. They will grieve bitterly for him, as for a firstborn son who has died. The sorrow and mourning in Jerusalem on that day will be like the great mourning for Hadad Rimon in the valley of Megiddo. All Israel will mourn, each clan by itself, and with the husbands separate from their wives, the clan of David will mourn alone as will the clan of Nathan, the clan of Levi, and the clan of Shemaiah. Each of the surviving clans from Judah will mourn separately and with the husbands separate from their wives. Psalm 126, a song for pilgrims ascending to Jerusalem. When the Lord brought back his exiles to Jerusalem, it was like a dream. We were filled with laughter, and we sang for joy, and the other nations said, What amazing things the Lord has done for them! Yes, the Lord has done amazing things for us. What joy! Restore our fortunes, Lord, as streams renew the desert. Those who plant in tears will harvest with shouts of joy. They will weep as they go to plant their seed, but they will sing as they return with the harvest. 
Luke 14 One Sabbath day, Jesus went to eat dinner in the home of a leader of the Pharisees, and the people were watching him closely. There was a man there whose arms and legs were swollen. Jesus asked the Pharisees and experts in religious law, Is it permitted in the law to heal people on the Sabbath day or not? When they refused to answer, Jesus touched the sick man and healed him and sent him away. Then he turned to them and said, Which of you doesn't work on the Sabbath? If your son or your cow falls into a pit, don't you rush to get him out? Again they could not answer. When Jesus noticed that all who had come to the dinner were trying to sit in seats of honor near the head of the table, he gave them this advice. When you are invited to a wedding feast, don't sit in the seat of honor. What if someone who is more distinguished than you has also been invited? The host will come and say, give this person your seat. Then you will be embarrassed and you will have to take whatever seat is left at the foot of the table. Instead, take the lowest place at the foot of the table. Then when your host sees you, he will come and say, Friend, we have a better place for you. Then you will be honored in front of all the other guests. For those who exalt themselves will be humbled. And those who humble themselves will be exalted. Then he turned to his host. When you put on a luncheon or banquet, he said, don't invite your friends, brothers, relatives, and rich neighbors, for they will invite you back, and that will be your only reward. Instead, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, and the blind. Then at the resurrection of the righteous, God will reward you for inviting those who could not repay you. Hearing this, a man sitting at the table with Jesus exclaimed, What a blessing it will be to attend a banquet in the kingdom of God! Jesus replied with this story. A man prepared a great feast and sent out many invitations. When the banquet was ready, he sent his servant to tell the guests, Come, the banquet is ready. But they all began making excuses. One said, I've just bought a field and must inspect it. Please excuse me. Another said, I've just bought five pair of oxen and I want to try them out. Please excuse me. Another said, I just got married so I can't come. The servant returned and told his master what they had said. His master was furious and said, Go quickly into the streets and alleys of the town and invite the poor, the crippled, the blind, and the lame. After the servant had done this, he reported, There's still room for more. So his master said, Go out into the country lanes and behind the hedges and urge anyone you find to come, so that the house will be full, for none of those I first invited will get even the smallest taste of my banquet. A large crowd was following Jesus. He turned around and said to them, If you want to be my disciple, you must by comparison hate everyone else, your father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, even your own life. Otherwise you cannot be my disciple. And if you do not carry your own cross and follow me, you cannot be my disciple. But don't begin until you count the cost. For who would begin construction of a building without first calculating the cost to see if there's enough money to finish it? Otherwise, you might complete only the foundation before running out of money. And then everyone would laugh at you. They would say, there's the person who started that building and couldn't afford to finish it. Or what king would go to war against another king without first sitting down with his counselors to discuss whether his army of 10,000 could defeat the 20,000 soldiers marching against him. And if he can't, he will send a delegation to discuss terms of peace while the enemy is still far away. So you cannot become my disciple without giving up everything you own. Salt is good for seasoning, but if it loses its flavor, how do you make it salty again? Flavorless salt is good neither for the soil nor for the manure pile. 
it is thrown away. Anyone with ears to hear should listen and understand. And now, Lord, we ask that you'll open our ears and give your blessing to the reading of this word. Amen. There's a party going on, and it seems like everyone's invited, eventually. But those first recipients of the invitation valued their own lives above the masters, so they had all kinds of excuses. I've got to attend to this. I just purchased that. This just happened to me. So there's no lack of excuses offered. In the end, these folks were left out of the party by their own choosing and doing. But then the poor, the crippled, the lame and blind, those with no self-interest to speak of, respond to the invitation. They had no excuses. They only had gratitude. Right on the heels of this story, Luke tells us that there were crowds that were following Jesus. But Jesus tests these crowds. It seems that they too were there because of their own self-interests. Jesus had just finished telling the story of people who had gotten caught up on pursuing their own interests over God. Now he has a whole crowd upon him, and he tells them that if their following him is about self-promotion, then they've got him all wrong. One has to hate oneself, he says, and one's own life like the poor, blind, crippled, lame beggar. These people in the story, they hate their lives. They came to the banquet grateful that they were being invited to a new kind of life, that they were being seated at a table and honored by the master. This kind of humility is the only requirement to be a disciple and have a seat at the table of God. So Jesus turns around and tells this large crowd of people who are pursuing their own self-interests, you cannot become my disciple without giving up everything you own, your selfish ambition, your own attempts to save yourself, your pasts, your addictions, your pride, your arrogance. You've got to give up everything you own and hate it. And when you do that, the power to give up everything that owns you will be yours. There's so much that owns us. Our need to be recognized, our pride, arrogance, our past, our shame, these things can own us, but Jesus can set us free. He invites us to the table He wants us to recognize that indeed we are poor and blind and miserable and beggars. But we've been invited to the banquet. When we respond and come to his table, all that once owned us will be no more. We will be seated with him at his banquet. We will be made new. May we recognize who we are apart from him. There's an invitation to come though to him at his table and experience who you are in him. And that's the prayer that I have for my own soul. That's the prayer that I have for my family, for my wife, my daughters, my son. And that's the prayer that I have for you. May it be so. And now, let us pray. Lord God Almighty and Everlasting Father, you have brought us in safety to this new day. Preserve us with your mighty power, that we might not fall into sin or be overcome by adversity. And in all we do, direct us to the fulfilling of your purpose through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Dear Lord, you have made of one blood all the peoples of the earth and sent your blessed Son to preach peace to those who are far and those who are near. Grant that people everywhere may seek after you and find you. Bring the nations into your fold, pour out your spirit on all flesh, and hasten the coming of your kingdom. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And now, Lord, make me an instrument of your peace. Where there is hatred, let me sow love. Where there is injury, pardon. Where there is doubt, faith. Where there is despair, hope. Where there is darkness, light. And where there is sadness, joy. O Lord, grant that I might not seek so much to be consoled as to console, to be understood 
as to understand, to be loved as to love. For it is in the giving that we receive, in the pardoning that we are pardoned, it is in the dying that we are born unto eternal life. Amen. Almighty God, Father of all mercies, we, your grateful children, give you humble thanks for all your goodness and loving kindness to us and all you have made. We bless you for your creation, preservation, and all the blessings of this life, and above all, for your immeasurable love and your redemption of the world through our Lord Jesus Christ, for the means of grace and the hope of glory. Lord, we pray, give us such awareness of your mercies that with truly thankful hearts we may show forth your praise, not only with our lips, but with our lives, by the giving up of ourselves for your service in holiness and righteousness all our days. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, to whom with you and the Holy Spirit be all honor and glory through all ages. Amen. And now as our Lord has taught us, we are bold to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory for ever and ever. Amen. Well, hey, hey, what do you say, DRB family? I hope that you're doing well out there. Here we are at the very beginning of a new month. How about that? And these months are happening at a pretty fast clip. Before you know it, the year will be done and we'll be charging ahead into 2025. Incredible. Now, I don't want to get ahead of myself. I think I should probably live the rest of this year one day at a time. And we're going to do that by God's grace. We're going to take it as it comes, my friend, one day at a time. And by God's grace, he'll use even little things like this, what we're doing right here, to shape our hearts into something that resembles Jesus so that we as Jesus' people can head off into our days being a light, being a source of encouragement and hope, being a friend, being kind, being hopeful, being faithful, being all those things that we see so well in Jesus. That's my prayer as we spend this time together in these scriptures, that they will shape us. And I'm convinced more and more that it's not just the Bible that shapes us. No, it's relationships, it's others. It's God's presence in others, God's presence in the world. It's your own giftings, the way that he's equipped you to hear and to understand and to be who you are. All those things play a big part in our ability to to understand, to be shaped and formed, to go out into the world, to be his light. So let's have our hearts open and awakened to all of it, my friend. All of it. But hey, before I let you go, I want to say thank you. I want to say thank you as we begin this month to some of our partners. These are the people that have given so that we can give in return. So that these podcasts can go out every day. I want to say thank you to folks like my old college and family friend, Michelle Crouch, and Aaron Lee, Melissa Minini, Robert Hadula, Florence Atiega, Bob and Sue Bastiani, Michael Shearman, John Peralta, Kyle Paulson, Nancy and David A. Dean, Joetta Sanders, Janice Childers, David Strisick, 
Vanessa Kaufman, Naomi Gonzalez, and Karen McBride. Blessings to you, my sisters, my brothers, my co-laborers here in this work of the Lord. Well, hey, 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 what do you say we show up again here tomorrow and we will do this again? Lord willing and the creek don't rise, your brother Hunter plans on being here. Until that time, let's go forward in God's joy. Let's let his joy be our strength. And let us always remember this, that you are loved. No doubt about it. Alrighty, I'll talk to you again tomorrow. You guys take care.